the MISTER has a bunch of different options for controller input, from standard USB devices to snack adapters and other third-party accessories. And they all have their own trade-offs. But there's one option out there that tries to do it all. This is the blister. And it may just be the one input option to rule them all. The blister is a controller input board that replaces the USB hub that you would typically find on the MISTER stack. But instead of just using USB controllers, the blister lets you use various types of original console controllers as well. Now there are plenty of other technologies out there that do the same thing, but I want to talk about the blister in this video because it has some unique benefits and it's one of the only other zero lag alternatives to snack adapters. I'll start off by installing the blister into the MISTER stack. And then I'm gonna take you through both of the blister's two modes of operation. First, we'll talk about USB mode, and then I'm gonna take you into low latency mode, and we'll do a little bit of a comparison to snack adapters. And then I'm gonna talk about the features and the challenges that I found with the blister before wrapping it up. I bought my blister from the official Blissbox website, but you can also pick it up at ultimatemister.com. There are links to both options in the description below. My blister arrived in this box and had a couple of things that went along with it. First, it had this USB adapter, which connects the blister to your mister's DE10 nano board. And it also had this short cable, which has a USB 3 micro B connector on one end and a USB-A connector on the other end. This is used to connect the blister to the user I.O. port on your add-on board. It also came with a short power cable, which is used for passing power through the blister and into the DE10 Nano. And finally, there were a few standoffs for mounting it as well. Installing it is pretty straightforward. As part of the stack setup, the blister mounts underneath the DE10 Nano using the supplied standoffs. Once mounted, you can then connect the boards with the USB adapter. However, the adapter that came with my blister was too short, so I ended up having to file down the standoffs to make it fit. After the USB connector's on, you can then use the power cable to connect the power output jack to the DE10 Nano but I found that the power pass-through adapter that came with my MISTER stack fit fine, so I just used that instead. And then lastly, use the short USB 3 cable to plug the blister into the user I.O. port. Once the blister is added to the MISTER stack, you'll no longer power the MISTER through the I.O. board. Instead, you'll need to plug the power cable directly into the power input port on the blister. And if you're an analog I.O. board user, then this is great news because this now gives your mister a power button. And if you use the digital I.O. board, then the power switch on top of your mister is now useless. But that's okay because as you'll see in a few minutes, I think it's a worthwhile sacrifice. All right, the blister is ready to go. So we can go ahead and connect it to a monitor and a controller adapter to check out some of its capabilities. To start, I'm going to use a standard NES controller. When the MISTER starts up and you're in the menu system, the blister is in USB mode. And as you can see, I'm able to navigate the MISTER's menu system with my original NES controller in this mode. To understand what's going on here, let's take a deeper look at how the blister works in USB mode. Now, this can be a little confusing, so I want to clarify something before we dive in. When the blister is running in USB mode, it can use both USB controllers and original controllers, and it can use them at the same time. But in this mode, original console controllers are treated like USB devices, so they're subject to USB polling, and therefore they also have latency. Whenever you use a USB device, such as a game controller, it has to talk to a USB host. In this relationship, the USB host is the one that's in control. To collect data from the device, 
the host will ask the device for the data on a regular schedule. This is called polling. So when you press a button on a USB controller, the data isn't sent immediately to the host. Instead, all the button presses are queued up on the device and sent over to the host the next time it pulls the controller. Different USB devices have different limitations. So while one USB controller may be capable of sending data to the host every millisecond, another controller may require more time. To determine how quickly it can pull for data, the USB host asks the device for its preferred polling rate when it's first connected. In our setup here, the USB host is the mister, and the blister can play two different roles. First, if you connect a USB controller to the blister, it acts as a USB hub and passes the USB connection onto the USB host, which is the mister. Since each controller determines its own polling rate, the USB latency will vary depending on which controller you use. The blister doesn't change the polling rate of USB controllers at all. But if you connect an original console controller to the blister while it's in USB mode, then the blister itself acts as the USB controller. To do this, it functions as a conversion device. It understands how to talk to your original controllers and then translates those signals into USB before sending it over to the mister. According to the Blissbox website, this translation is done using the Blissbox chip. Now that statement gives the impression that there's a custom chip on board doing this conversion process. But when I took a closer look at the device, I actually found a pair of AT Mega 328 microcontrollers. Now this chip may sound familiar to you, because it's the same microcontroller that's used in the Arduino Uno. When you plug an original controller into the blister, it uses the AT Mega microcontroller to speak to it in its native protocol. And the reason that there are two of them is because each controller port has its own dedicated microcontroller. This is a great thing because it means that the input processing doesn't have to share CPU cycles with another device. Once the original controller input is translated, the blister then passes that data off to its onboard USB hub chip, which then communicates with the mister. This whole translation process takes time. So the question is, what's the USB latency when running in this mode? To figure that out, I'm going to capture the USB packets using a protocol analyzer called Wireshark. To take this capture, I'll plug the blister into my PC by connecting the micro USB port to my computer. And we also need an external power source, so I'll plug it into a five volt adapter as well. Next, I'll start up Wireshark and tell it to capture the traffic on the computer's USB ports. I'll do that by going into the capture options dialog and starting a capture for the interface named USB PCAP1. Now that it's running, I'll turn on the blister and wait a few seconds for it to be recognized. Now we have a bunch of USB traffic here, but what we're looking for is the enumeration property called B interval. This is the number of milliseconds that the USB device wants the host to wait between polling requests. Okay, now this is the list of all the USB data packets that have B interval in them. You'll notice that there are two USB sources that were enumerated in this capture. And that's because each controller presents itself to the host as a different USB device. And when we dig into one, you'll notice that the B interval given to the USB host by the blister is eight milliseconds. Eight milliseconds isn't terrible. It's still very playable, but there are definitely USB controllers out there that do a much better job. Now the USB host doesn't have to honor the polling interval requested by the USB device. For example, you can configure the mister to do one millisecond polling, regardless of what the controller says. But remember that the blister does have to translate the controller data to USB. So a slower polling rate is needed to give it enough time to do that. But if you buy a blister, it's probably not for using original controllers in USB mode. So now let's take a look at its main feature, low latency mode. We know that the blister uses the AT Mega chips to connect directly to the HDMI ports that you plug original controllers into. 
And as I mentioned earlier, with USB mode, the connection runs through the USB hub chip to communicate with the USB host. But to get around the USB polling limitations, the blister can be used in a way that circumvents the USB chip entirely, and this is what I'm referring to as low latency mode. The AT Mega still talks to the original controllers through the HDMI port, but instead of sending the data through USB, it provides it directly to the user port on the mister. The user port looks like a standard USB port, but it's not. There's no USB host controller chip behind it. Instead, the pins from this port connect directly to the FPGA. So what you can do is plug in different accessories that a mister core can use directly. And this includes snack adapters. Now, if you haven't seen my other videos which dive deeper into snacks, I'd recommend going back and watching those after this video. Even though they both use the user port, there's a big difference between the way snacks work and the way the blister works. Snack adapters use the native functionality of the game console to collect controller input. For example, the NES clocks a signal into the controller to pull the button presses out of its onboard shift register. So when you're using the NES snack with the mister, the same thing's happening. The only difference is that there's a level shifter in place to make sure that the right voltage levels are used with the controller. But this isn't the case with the blister. Instead, the blister acts as an interpreter between the controller and the game system. It uses the native functionality of the controller in order to collect its input, but when it talks to the core running on the mister, the blister uses a different protocol that it calls the LLAPI, or Low Level Application Programming Interface. At the heart of it, the LLAPI is just a two-wire data transfer protocol, and the folks over at Blessbox have done a pretty good job of documenting its functionality. So to gather the controller data from the blister, the mister just sends LLAPI commands to the blister using this protocol. But the native mister cores don't understand the LLAPI protocol outright. So a community of developers have built special forked versions of the mister cores that include LLAPI support. So to use low latency mode with the blister, you need to install the LLAPI cores and use those instead. Installing them is pretty simple. The LLAPI cores are built into the update all script on the mister, so you just need to make sure that you run the script and select the option to install the LLAPI cores. Once installed, these cores show up under a separate LLAPI menu item on the mister, and you'll know that the controller is in LLAPI mode when you load a game and the LED next to the controller port turns from green to red. And this in and of itself is pretty interesting. Low latency mode can be invoked through USB. This gives you the ability to use the blister in USB mode in the mister menu system, and then through a software trigger, seamlessly transition it over to using low latency mode, something that can't be done with most snack implementations. But you may be wondering, how does this eliminate input lag? Well, the answer to that lies in how the LLAPI is implemented in the forked cores. To understand this, let's take a closer look at how input lag occurs with USB. Most games look for controller input between frames that it draws to the display. So for North American displays that refresh at 60 Hertz, those games will query for controller input once every 16.67 milliseconds. Now let's say you have a USB device that gets pulled every 8 milliseconds. Because the polling isn't synchronized with the console's input processing, there will always be a 0 to 48% chance that you'll press a button on one frame and it won't be processed until the following frame. If you increase the polling rate, the percentage drops. For example, if you're pulling every millisecond, then there's a 0 to 6% chance that it'll happen. But no matter how fast your polling rate is, you're never going to get it down to 0%. But instead of polling, the LLAPI cores insert the LLAPI module into the console's native methods. So when a game goes to read the controller input, it's actually calling the LLAPI, which is in turn gathering the input from the blister on demand. And what you end up with 
is a zero lag experience when using LLAPI cores. Okay, now that you understand how the blister works in both USB and low latency mode, let's take a look at a couple of things that make the blister a really interesting device. The first thing I wanna call out is something that I've already mentioned earlier in this video. The fact that you can use original console controllers to navigate the Mr. Menu system. With most other options like the snack adapters, you need to have a USB controller plugged into your Mr. to navigate the menu. And then once you're in a core and you've enabled snack, you can then switch over to the native controller. But with the blister, you can do everything from the native controller. No USB controllers are required. Another really cool feature is that you can mix and match controllers. Now maybe you want to use an NES controller with the Game Boy Core, or a PlayStation controller with the Super Nintendo Core, or how about the Dreamcast controller with the Genesis Core? Yes, all of these options work, and they all have zero input lag. And I think this is especially important for handheld cores like the Game Boy or the Atari Lynx, because it's not possible to have a zero lag experience on those devices with snack. The last feature I want to call out here is Turbo Fire. At any point during a game, you can hold down a button and press start three times on the controller. And that causes the blister to send repeated button presses to the core when you hold down that button. Just like those old turbo enabled controllers such as the NES Advantage. As I'm sure you can tell, I've really been enjoying the blister. And if I could rewind the clock, I would totally buy it again. But my glasses aren't entirely rose colored because there are some challenges that you should be aware of because they may impact the decision as to whether or not you spend your hard earned money on the blister. The first challenge I want to mention is the cost. At the time that I'm recording this in early 2024, the blister costs $79 for the board alone. But along with that, you're going to need some controller adapters. Now by themselves, those adapters aren't too expensive. They're $9 each, and you can buy them in packs for a little bit of a discount. But if you're like me and want to have adapters for all the consoles you want to play on, the cost will add up quickly. Now there is another option. The hardware design for the blister and the controller adapters is open source. So you can go off and make your own if you want to take the time to do that. And that leads me into my next challenge with the blister. The hardware is open source, but the firmware is not. Now I searched for quite a while looking for the firmware source code, and the closest thing I could find was an old version from the genesis of this project. I think it would be beneficial to have the source code available. Not only would it help the blister live on in case anything happens to the company, but it would also enable others in the community to add features to it. And along those same lines, the final challenge I want to point out is that the blister requires modified cores that aren't officially supported by the Mr. community. And I could be wrong, but I think there's only one person maintaining those cores. When I look in the GitHub repository, I don't see the modified source code that includes the LLAPI committed to the repo, only the RBF files. Now, I don't want this to come across as me complaining at all. I understand that maintaining these cores is a passion project, and it's really admirable for someone to take it on. But it would be great to have the modified source code in the repo so others can contribute. And then maybe we'd see more frequent updates and be able to keep the project going if for some reason the current maintainer has to stop contributing. Are these reasons for you not to purchase a blister? Well, maybe. It depends on how comfortable you are with using an accessory that has these constraints. But I would say, overall, I really am happy with the blister and expect it to be a permanent fixture in my Mr. setup, at least for the time being. There are many more things that I could have gotten into in this video, but just didn't have the time. So you'll see the blister coming back in future videos as I talk about other topics such as light guns, multi-tap adapters, and a few other interesting accessories. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you own a blister, feel free to share your own experiences as well. Or if you have other topics that you'd like to see me cover, please do post a comment and let me know. Alright, I'll see you next time, but until then, go make something cool.